Um, I want to thank our other moderators and tech support today, Sandro Grassa and Lauren Slownwhite. And then a big thank you to Tom Bain. He is our speaker today. Our topic is the microbiome's control of immune function. And uh, again, a thank you to the Microbiome Labs for sponsoring this lecture as part of the Integrated Fertility Symposium, which we have opened up to everybody in our family here on Healthy Seminars. So you don't have to be part of the IFS to access this. I just wanna share a few things. Um, as I mentioned, today's lecture is by Microbiome Labs. I'm gonna come back to their sponsor page in a moment. I just wanna remind you that this is one of our community unity immunity lectures on healthy seminars. If you're looking to find out what's happening in healthy seminars, come to the healthy seminars website, healthyseminars.com, click on resources, and it will take you to this page. And then you can see our calendar of events. So today we got Dr. Tom Bain talking about the microbiome. And then you can see on our calendar what else we have happening during the week. Often our free lectures, our community lectures are during the week. And then we often have our CEU PDA approved lectures on the weekend. If you want to know more about these lectures, you can either click on the link um, or and it'll take you usually to a Zoom link or a registration page. And then below the page, you can see what's happening as well if you want a little bit more detail. So as you can see, we have a lecture on June 9th on cosmetic acupuncture. And if you scroll down, you can just see where everything is happening. And then we have our IFS stuff. And here we are gonna talk with Dr. Tom Bain. He's gonna talk about how we've lived through the unprecedented time with this pandemic spread of COVID-19 um, in an effort to decrease our susceptibility to other harmful viral infections. This is an opportunity to collectively educate patients of the power of preventative healthcare and to get a better understanding of our natural defenses. The microbiome and the immune system are inextricably connected and the immune system would cease to function, function without the microbiome. It acts as the neighborhood watch, this microbiome for the immune system, allowing us effective surveillance of a mucosal system that is over 3,000 square feet in surface area and inhibited by over 4 trillion microbiomes. And in this lecture, you're about to listen to, and then we'll have a Q&A with Dr. Tom Bain. He's going to provide a review of the components of the immune system, the kinetics of our immune response, and the critical support and checkpoints managed by the microbiome. One of our most powerful tools in fighting invading pathogens is a healthy microbiome. And this talk will illustrate what exactly that means. Last year for IFS 2020, um, Dr. Tom Bain did a talk on um, the microbiome as well. Um, and he talked about the cytokine storm. And I think he's gonna kind of review some of that as well. And here we are a year later, and we're gonna continue to talk about this. I just wanna to bring to your attention that if you wanna know more about the microbiome and their specials and their deals, if you go to the IFS website, which by the way, when you're on healthy seminars, at the very top, there's a link to IFS 2021. So if you click on that, it will take you to the IFS website. And we've made the sponsor pages with their deals and their videos available to anybody. You don't have to be registered for the IFS to benefit from these videos that are on the sponsor pages. So if you click sponsors and you scroll into the microbiome labs, they have an introduction. They talk a little bit about their company, and then if you scroll down here near the logo, this beautiful picture, there's a link to sign up for their deals. So if you're interested in their products, do contact them because they have specials for both existing and new customers. So if you're interested in this product, um, please contact them for that. Also, if you want the handouts, which has a lot of references to studies and the handouts look excellent, please also use this link, Microbiome Labs, to contact them. They have agreed and they're very happy to send you the PDF of the slides that you're about to see. So again, if you want the handouts for this lecture, please do contact Microbiome Labs. And I will let you know that on their sponsor page, they also have a specific talk on the microbiome and infertility. Obviously, um, it's part of the Integrated Fertility Symposium. So immune function is good for everything and very important when it comes to fertility. And then this one is very specific to the microbiome and infertility. So if you want handouts for either of these lectures, they're available on their sponsor page. Do contact Microbiome Labs and you can use this link on their sponsor page um, uh, to do that. Again, how do you get there? On the healthyseminars.com website, click on the menu IFS 2021, click on sponsors and then scroll down and you'll find the microbiome labs. If you can't memorize the IFS website, go through the Healthy Seminars page and they'll be happy to let you know about their specials and they'll also be happy to let you know um, or be able to send you handouts. The other thing I wanna let you know is that 
For all those that are part of the IFS, remember to continue to watch your CU PDA lectures in order to get your CUs to complete those by June 30th. And on the forums where there's a continued discussion and we can continue this discussion on the forums about the microbiome um, after, you can go there and post questions and I'll let Tom know if there's any questions there for him. And then do check out the special offer if you are part of the IFS, because that's where um, the exhibitors are posting their specials and deals. So all the sponsors have specials and deals. So do check that out one last time. You can also get to the sponsor page if you're not part of the IFS for microbiome, because they do have a special offer for you that you can find on that page. All right, as we bring up the lecture, I just want to remind you that this is for educational purposes only. This is not intended to, intended to be medical advice. Therefore, it should not be perceived as medical advice. If you have a health condition, please do seek out a healthcare provider because this is for educational purposes only. And then when you see the polls happening during the lecture, please fill those out. We just love to know who's here today. And um, without any further ado, we are going to start our lecture with Dr. Tom Bain. He's a, a trained uh, chiropractor, functional medicine by training, um, uh, founder of Microbiome Labs. And you're going to love this lecture. If it's anything that I've seen from last year and what I reviewed this year, I think you're going to love it. Please post your questions during this live replay of this lecture in the chat because Tom is with us. And at the end of this lecture, he is going to take your questions. So post them now, we'll moderate them at the end of this lecture, which is about 36 minutes. Go for it team. Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Bain. I'm the president and co-founder of Microbiome Labs. And I'm very happy to be here today, spend some time with you guys. And we're gonna start off today discussing the microbiome and the immune system. Um, would like to thank uh, IFS, Lauren and his team for putting this together. Very excited to spend some time with you in these COVID times. Um, also looking forward to answering your questions live uh, when we get the chance. So um, today we're gonna to explore the microbiome and the immune system and specifically the relationship with uh, viruses and, and specifically COVID-19. So uh, let's, let's jump in here. So, what we're looking at here, this, this new concept, more and more research every day is coming out and showing that really what we are as humans is we're this collection of symbionts or biomes. Um, and the collection of these symbionts creates the holobiome. And so when we look at the, at the human, we look at the uh, gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, the vaginal microbiome, the skin microbiome, look at all these individual microbiomes and we can look at them as individuals and we can look at the dysfunctions that we see in each of those biomes by themselves. But what we're also learning is that the crosstalk between these biomes, between the symbionts um, is critical. And we're seeing that dysfunctions in one biome can create distress and symptoms uh, in another part of the body. And so, so uh, really interesting and, and, and a new concept. There's more and more research coming out with this every day. And we're going to share some of the research that supports this. But I want you to think of yourselves as a holobiome, a, a, the sum of the uh, individual aspects of, of each of the individual biomes creating this holobiome. So, um, and here's a quick look at the immune kinetics and, and our immune system, just for a quick review for you guys. So we've got our innate immune system, our, the immune system that's just, it's patrolling our, our, through our body and it's, you know, the police of our immune system where they're just checking and making sure that nothing's wrong and then reacting when they find something wrong. And so um, innate immune response is, is an hourly response um, and, and, and it's typically associated with, a, with the pro-inflammatory uh, reactions in the body. Um, and then once we start to get some immune sampling by the macrophages and the dendritic cells and, and, and understanding that there actually is an infection, then we start to get antibody production by the B cells and we start to get cytokine production uh, by the T cells. And uh, this is a very important aspect of being able to fight infections. Um, and it, it becomes an anti-inflammatory process days into it after the initial inflammation has taken root. And then now we're actually fighting the infection and, and, and making headway against the virus. That's when we start to see the inflammation coming down. 
And so, so we'll be addressing different aspects of this throughout the rest of the lecture here. But what I want to talk to you now about is the immunobiology of the mucosa. And so the mucosa of the body is the largest surface area in the body. Uh, it's about 400 square meters of space when the skin is on average about two square meters. So just process that for a little bit. Um, it's the largest portion of your immune system, um, and most of it is found in your gut. Uh, the lines are areas of entry, it lines areas of entry to the body. So like um, your respiratory tract, where air comes in and where your body's very intimate with the environment, that is lined with, with mucosa. Uh, the digestive tract, again, where we're interacting with the foods we eat, lined with mucosa. Uh, the reproductive tract, the skin, all of these areas are lined with the mucosa lining as a way for our immune system to sample our environment and to uh, prevent and fight infection. So uh, the mucosa is the largest site of immune sampling in the body. And to talk about something being covered in microbes, uh, the mucosa is actually covered in microbes. And this is an example of what we mean. So there are 40 trillion or more microbial cells, but we've only got about 2 million immune cells. And so, uh, that's 200,000 times more microbial cells than immune cells available to help monitor your system. So what we're seeing is basically it's, it's very much like a, uh, a large city, you know, where you've got a large population of people, but you have a smaller population of police um, neighborhood watch people, but the people that are there and are looking out for the community and making sure that uh, the bad guys aren't taking over. It's a relatively small amount, but it's a very active uh, number of cells. And, and there's some very specific ways that they behave in response to viruses. And we'll go through that in a little bit, but let's look at some of the crosstalk, some of the, some of the communication that's happening between the microbiome and the immune system. So there's some basic things that, that, that we know of where dietary fibers through bacterial fermentation become short chain fatty acids. And then those short chain fatty acids support the enteroendocrine cells, the goblet cells, they reduce inflammation in the microbiome. They, um, you know, increase uh, your, your body's ability to burn fatty fats as energy. And so this is, this is one form of crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system. Um, the goblet cells then producing mucus uh, creates balance in the microbiome, pushes the bacteria away from the epithelial lining. Uh, we've got panic cells that are producing antimicrobials. Uh, we've got... Uh, bacteria and viruses being sampled by the dendritic cells at the, the toll-like receptor complexes. And we get a cascade of, of uh, cytokines that are being produced in response to, to the bacteria and the viral sampling. Uh, we also have LPS that's being sampled and, and, and creating a cytokine reaction. We've got plasma cells that are producing higher concentrations of IgA. So we've got primary bile salts being broken down into secondary bile salts. And, and so there's so much going on in this space. And it's this constant communication between uh, the microbiome and the immune system. And it's kind of like a tennis match. It's kind of like the epithelial lining is the, is the tennis net and the uh, immune system's on one side and the, the uh, microbiome's on the other. And, and then there's all this crosstalk and crossing over uh, that the two of them do. So it's fascinating. And obviously, I gave a very superficial view of, of that science right now. But I just want to hopefully communicate that this is a very complex um, relationship between the microbiome and the immune system. And then we go into secondary uh, lymph, lymph organs and, and immune organs. And so we look at the uh, secondary lymphoid organs and tissues um, in the throat. We've got the thymus. We've got lymph nodes under the armpits. Uh, we've got the spleen and bone marrow, 
payers patches, mesenteric lymph nodes, urogenital lymph nodes. So what we have is we have this um, immune communication that's happening between uh, the epithelial tissues and the microbiome. And then we've got these areas, these secondary lymphatic organs that serve as areas of amplification. So when the, when the microbiome and the immune system are talking and they're going to say, hey, there's a virus. So then it's the, it's the job of the immune system then to magnify that message and spread it systemically throughout the body via the lymph nodes and, and the communication with, with the secondary aspects of the immune system uh, via the lymph nodes. So a very complex symphony of communication with our immune system um, and, and one that becomes very specific in response to a viral infection, um, which we'll talk about now. So um, we're going to talk about a lot of different viruses, but just because there's not a lot of research yet with um, COVID, we're just going to talk about what we understand and how the human body fights certain types of infections. So during a norovirus infection, lactobacilli and other types of commensal bacteria actually uh, trigger a release of, of interferon beta and interferon gamma, which tells the innate immune system that there's a virus present. Um, this process is always uh, is uh, also vitamin A dependent uh, because that's a substrate that the commensal bacteria uh, need to use these uh, this inter these interferons. So during a rotavirus infection, uh, bacterial flagellin from commensal bacteria activate the expression of pattern recognition receptors. So this triggers the expression of toll-like receptor five, which then stimulates the release of interleukin twenty-two and interleukin eighteen. So interleukin-22 is a, um, a cytokine that helps repair damaged epithelium, and interleukin-18 induces apoptosis in infected epithelial cells. So the reaction that the immune system, uh, that the uh, microbiome has to the presence of a rotavirus infection is to immediately repair, help repair the epithelium and to uh, destroy infected cells. Because what does the rotavirus infection do? It immediately burrows into that epithelium and starts to disrupt the, uh, the epithelial barrier. So the, having an immune reaction that is a direct response uh, to prevent the virus from invading the body that way, um, that, that comes from millions of years of evolution with viruses. So um, bifidobacterium brevae and uh, galacto galactoligosaccharides and fructoligosaccharides, uh, two, two types of prebiotics, have been shown to prevent rotavirus infection by increasing interferon gamma, interleukin-4, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and, and toll-like receptor 2, which all, doing all those things, will increase mucosal immune defense. So, the, the body has learned that a rotavirus infection is going to disrupt, massively disrupt the microbiome and specifically the uh, epithelial lining. And so over time, we have created this dramatic and rather strong response to the rotavirus to protect those areas of our body. Commensal bacteria produce short chain fatty acids. And so um, this is important to increase and maintain the mucus production by the goblet cells. And this creates a strong barrier against pathogens. Uh, additionally, the commensals also increase the synthesis of antiviral compounds like reactive oxygen species and defensins, which prevent local viral rep replication, right? So it's one thing to have a virus, but if you can prevent that virus from replicating, then the virus really can't do any damage. And so when we look at all the ways that the microbiome is impacting viruses, one, it's just front and center, uh, ready to battle the virus. Two, it's ready to protect the areas that the virus uh, uh, damages most. Um, and then three, it's able to uh, strengthen the mucosal layer and, and and prevent the replication of the virus. So, so we're kind of hitting the virus from multiple different sides in order to, uh, to control its spread.
So during influenza infection, commensal bacteria trigger the, the release of something called inflammasome. Uh, this is a potent defense against influenza replication. So these inflammasomes induce dendritic cell migration to the local lymph nodes to stimulate influenza specific T cell response in the lungs. So, so really like getting the virus from all different angles and uh, preventing it from uh, adhering to the tissue and preventing it from replicating. So some other information that we wanna share here. So the gut microbiota regulates the respiratory mucosal immune response and re respiratory influenza. That stimulates IgA secretion, Th1 activation, and cytotoxic T cell priming. So when the virus is present in the lungs, gut commensal bacteria increase the presence of innate immune cells, causing the release of cytokines, a whole slew of them, but interleukin-33, interleukin-1 alpha, interleukin-1 alpha, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-12, and, and, uh, and INF gamma. So this, these cause the, the natural killer cells and dendritic cells and macrophages to really uh, get to the lungs and focus on the infection that's in the lungs. So again, a systemic response to a local infection and, and bringing all aspects of the immune system in to, uh, to, to uh, impact the infection. So when a virus is low or not present, gut commensals do the opposite by stimulating the re release of the anti-inflammatory uh, interleukin, interleukin-10. And so, um, so in times of virus, respond and, and do things to stop the replication and stop the adherence of the virus to the tissues. When virus is not present, create anti-inflammatory compounds that calm and sedate the area. So this act, this balancing act between uh, the, the gut and the lung is an example of, of the gut-lung axis. And what it shows how microbes in the lung communicate with microbes in the gut to inform them on the presence of the pathogen. And then the systemic immune system is dependent on the gut responding to that message from the lungs and to mobilize the, the troops against the infection. So Staph aureus on an airway surface recruits monocytes that mature to macrophages through the activation of toll-like receptor two during lung infection. So that's a very fast local shift our immune system does as a way of reducing uh, lung damage or tissue damage in the lungs to the infection. So one of the respiratory commensal bacteria, corny bacterium, um, it modulates a toll-like receptor three antiviral response and this is specifically to respiratory syncytial virus. And it does this by enhancing tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, interferon gamma, interferon beta. And it does this by increasing T cell proliferation. So again, a systemic response to a local infection. We've got local changes that are happening to reduce the infection and prevent uh, tissue damage. And we've got systemic reaction by the immune system to control the infection. So the butyrate, one of the specific uh, short chain fatty acids from the commensal bacteria, they lower inflammatory damage um, early in the innate period by activating GPR in the cell surfaces and stimulating interleukin uh, 22. So again, there's, there's a lot of different responses that are happening, but all of them are dependent on a healthy response from the gut microbiome um, in order to get the systemic immune system to effectively respond to the virus. So this is true with viruses in general, right? So we've got specific research on different types of, of viruses, um, but this is, this is our body's natural response to a viral infection. And so in order for us to have that healthy response, we've got to have a healthy microbiome. So, the direct effect of commensals. So here's some interesting information. We've got some studies here showing that um, specific spores, Bacillus subtilis in, in, in this particular case, um, produces surfactant, and that prevents the invasion of specific types of coronaviruses. And that's the, the one that were, was studied here was a transmissible gastroenteritis virus. Um, but, but the production of surfactant by Bacillus subtilis was shown to dramatically reduce the incidence of this infection. 
Here's a study that showed that subtilis produces a powerful antiviral compound called P18, uh, and that completely neutralized influenza virus in vitro. Uh, other studies have demonstrated that these strains do that in vivo antiviral effects also. Um, here, subtilis produces antimicrobial lipopeptides. Those lipopeptides contain surfactant and fengicin, which each have very strong antiviral effects. And that effectively inactivates the viruses, specifically uh, porcine parvovirus, Newcastle disease virus, infectious bursal disease virus, you know, and, and obviously there'll be some studies going with uh, coronavirus soon too, but just going with the, the data that's in the, in the uh, research studies right now. So, and the last study shows that a B sub subtilis produces Levan, which is also an antimicrobial compound, which inhibits various forms of adenovirus, including uh, respiratory RNA virus and enteric adenovirus. So, uh, Bacillus subtilis is uh, probably, I, I would say Bacillus subtilis is the best immune modulating and competitive excluding spore of the bunch. Um, it has the ability to fight for space on the epithelial surface. It has the ability to compete for food with an infection. It has the ability to produce upwards of 12 different antibiotics that we've been able to identify to date. And it's been able to, to produce at least four different antiviral compounds that we know of to date. So what we see with the subtilis is, is a very strong inhibition of infection replication, whether that's bacterial or viral. I know we're talking about viral here, but I, I, I would like to point out that subtilis is a very strong inhibitor of pathogenic bacteria growth as well as viral growth. So here's some, you know, where we're just talking about immune fitness, right? Just the health of the immune system in general and its ability to, to fight viruses. So uh, the data from Cell Press uh, indicates that commensal derived signals provide tonic immune stimulation that establishes the activation threshold of the innate immune system required for optimal antiviral act active immunity. So what are we saying? We're saying that um, in order for there to be the most optimal response to virus, we've got to have a balanced, healthy microbiome. We've got to have a balanced, healthy bacteria, lower pathogens, higher concentrations of, of keystone strains, strains that are producing high concentrations of short chain fatty acids. On this, in the second study, we see that type one interferon signaling from the microbiome was shown to be required in order to get the dendritic cells to respond to pathogen entry. So that's critically important for antiviral function. So without a signal from the microbiome, the dendritic cells cannot mount a response to the viral infection. So a dysfunctional microbiome will prevent your initial response and your potentially your long-term response um, to a virus. So this is a collection of research studies that each show that the use of antibiotics reduces immune response towards infection, okay? I'm not gonna go through each one of them individually, but I just wanna bring it to your attention. There's a lot of data. This is just a few of the studies that show that when you take an antibiotic, you actually reduce your body's ability to fight infection. Okay, so that this is the this is the research that supports. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Let's just say there's a lot of inflammation that supports that notion. Now, this is an interesting study too. This study shows that dysbiosis is one of the key um, important factors in immune checkpoint therapy in cancer patients. So. What they were able to find out is that patients that had taken antibiotics previous to doing immunotherapy, checkpoint, in, checkpoint inhibition therapy for cancer, if they had taken antibiotics previous to doing that therapy, that the antibiotics were negatively associated with overall survival and 
and progression-free survival. So meaning, okay, you, you survive for X period of time, that's overall survival, but progression-free survival means you survived without any progression of the disease whatsoever. So both of these factors were uh, negatively associated with, with the treatment of, of the use of, of cancer immunotherapy. So basically what they're saying is, if you've taken antibiotics previously to doing immunotherapy, the likelihood that that immunotherapy is going to work is very, very low. In fact, one of the leading cancer researchers in, in the field of immunotherapy, he focuses on uh, melanoma. Melanoma has a very good response to, to immunotherapy uh, about 20% of the time. So about 20% of the time, people are phase three or stage three, stage four uh, melanoma will respond with a complete resolution of the cancer 20% of the time. The other 80% um, will, will be a combination of no response or worse response uh, to, that, to, the, to the cancer immunotherapy. And one of the leading researchers in this field, uh, uh, someone who I've gotten to know over the last few years, has said that the only thing that he can find that's different in a person that responds favorably versus somebody who doesn't respond favorably to cancer immunotherapy is the presence of short chain fatty acid producing bacteria in the microbiome. That's the only difference. So after looking at the research we did showing that we could increase the growth of keystone strains like Acromensia and fecal and bacteria and prosnitsi, he felt like if we could do that, we did that obviously in healthy patients. He felt if we could do that in cancer patients, that we could increase the effectiveness of, of immunotherapy from 20% to somewhere around 50%. So we're going through those studies right now to see if we can modulate the immune system before the use of immunotherapy to increase the outcomes. Obviously, cancer research is difficult, especially in times of COVID. So we'll keep you posted how that research is going. But, but there's a big connection between a healthy microbiome and, um, and positive outcomes with immunotherapy in cancer patients. So here's our, a picture of our leaky gut, right? And so the blue shaded area that you see that's eroded here, kind of in the middle, is, is, the, is the mucin layer. It's the mucus layer that sits on top of the epithelial layer, which the epithelial layer looks kind of like that, that caterpillar, like uh, purple, blue, and red that you see in the middle. And then below that is your basal lateral circulation. And so the mucin layer is supposed to buffer the microbiome away from the epithelial layer. Now we see here because of dysbiosis, we see that the um, dysbiosis has eroded the mucin layer. The microbiome is now laying on top of the epithelial layer. This is creating an inflammatory response, it's causing the tight junctions to open. And we're seeing bacteria and bacterial waste products, specifically LPS, spilling into the basal lateral circulation. We're seeing it being sampled by the macrophage, and then we're seeing the cytokine response, the production of interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1-beta, and the associated inflammation with that, right? This is the leaky gut. This is ground zero for all health conditions, but what we're looking at specifically is uh, an inability to fight viruses when you're in this state. So first of all, this gut is already in an inflamed state. It's already trying to heal itself. It's reacting as if the body is in a septic state in response to what's happening at, this, at the tight junctions. And the LPS is the trigger for the cytokine storm that's creating the inflammation. So let's look at the pre-existing medical conditions for COVID-19. So the death rates in, with these pre-existing conditions are, are the numbers that you see. So much higher than what the death rate is with people with no pre-existing conditions. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer hmm, probably don't have anything to do with each other. I, I don't know if we can, we're going to be able to find something that can connect these things. Let's see. Okay, so here's a study that shows that the entry of LPS into the systemic circulation leads to intracellular transcription of several inflammatory mediators. The resulting inflammation has been implicated in the development of the progression of atherosclerosis 
and the subsequent coronary artery disease and heart failure that comes from it. Okay, so well, the coronary artery disease has a direct connection to LPS in the system. Here's diabetes. So most of the studies observed higher LPS or LBP. LPS is LBP is LPS binding protein. So if there's a lot of that, then you assume that there's a lot of LPS. So studies that observed either higher LPS or LBP concentrations in diabetic subjects than in healthy controls. In fact, one of the studies showed that the best way to monitor a hyperglycemic patient, whether they were going to go from hyperglycemia to type 2 diabetes, was the concentration of LPS in their serum. Now, we clearly got a connection with LPS and, and diabetes. Let's continue. Chronic exposure to significant levels of LPS is reported to be associated with the development and or progression of many types of lung diseases, including asthma, chronic bronchitis, and progressive irresistible airflow obstruction. So they're all characterized by chronic inflammatory processes in the lungs. So now the third comorbidity, chronic, chronic respiratory infection, chronic respiratory disease, I'm sorry, also has a connection to LPS. Well, how about blood pressure? Well, LPS decreases blood pressure as well as vascular contractility and increases vascular cytokine expression via toll-like receptor 4 pathway. So LPS is creating problems in patients with blood pressure problems also. And here's one of many studies showing the connection between LPS and, and poor outcomes in, in this case, pancreatic cancer. I could have done a whole lecture on this as every cancer out there has a study that shows the disruption that LPS creates in the process of that cancer. And so I just chose this one because it was the one in front of me, but I could have chosen any number of ones. And like I said, I could do an actual whole lecture on this, this aspect of it. So in reality, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer are all connected via the gut microbiome. And the spilling of LPS into the bloodstream and the reciprocal cytokine cascade release of cytokines that happens in response to the LPS in the bloodstream. So what that says to me is if you are not protecting your patient's microbiome, then you are not helping them prevent or treat COVID-19. Their ability to fight off a viral infection is going to be compromised if their microbiome is not functioning at its peak. So we've shown the ability to reduce LPS very quickly. This was a pilot study that we did, and we showed that at a five-hour point after patients ate a McDonald's breakfast, we were able to increase their LPS five to six X in their serum. So the spilling of LPS from the gut into the bloodstream at the five hour mark hit a peak at five to six X what it was at the feeding time. We sent these students home with the 30 day supply of the probiotic, had them come back and do the same test meal again. And we completely blunted the amount of circulating endotoxin in their system. We also reduced the number of the inflammatory cytokines that we see increasing in response to LPS spilling into the bloodstream. So we've done this in a, in a double blind placebo controlled study, and we're doing it again now in a 90 day study with twice as many uh, people in it, because we're trying to see um, what this situation looks like over time. You know, a 30 day trial is great, but what does it look like over 90 days? And are we able to extrapolate some more information over that? So we'll definitely keep you guys posted. But reconditioning of the microbiome is the only real science that we can talk about when it comes to treating viral infections. And so what we're looking at with reconditioning is we're looking at getting rid of pathogenic organisms and creating an environment that's conducive for the commensal bacteria, the bacteria that we got from our mom, to increase in their numbers. Those short chain fatty acid producing bacteria to increase in their numbers so that we get a higher concentration of those short chain fatty acids. So, We've been able to show that the use of megasporbiotic, we're basically 
revitalizing the garden. We're modulating the microbiota through the use of corn sensing. We're increasing short chain fatty acid production by just under 40%. We're encouraging the growth of keystone bacteria like Acromensia, Fecalum bacterium, and Bifidobacterium. So Megaspore is the first 100% spore-based broad-spectrum probiotic clinically shown to improve leaky gut by 60% in just 30 days. So this unique all-spore formula reconditions the gut by increasing microbial diversity and encouraging the growth of key health-promoting commensal gut bacteria. So in conclusion, a healthy, diverse microbiome provides critical signaling and energetics to the immune system to create proper immune function. Higher pathogen load disrupts the immune response, so getting rid of pathogens is a key aspect in restoring healthy immune response. A disrupted microbiome leads to improper attenuated immune response against pathogens, so the ability to fight infections is reduced when the microbiome is disrupted. A disrupted microbiome is also the most prevalent source of chronic low-grade inflammation through endotoxemia and barrier dysfunction. That's the LPS and the, and the reciprocal cytokine response that the body has to LPS in the basal lateral circulation. Immune support ingredients are very important. I cannot speak to how important vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin zinc, et cetera, are for the combating of COVID-19 and the importance of that for your immune system. But if it cannot overcome a dysfunctional microbiome, um, if you have an unhealthy microbiome, then it's very difficult to absorb those nutrients. And so, so I'm not saying one should be done in place of the other. They are both equally important and they are both there. They function using different mechanisms, but having the microbiome in a healthy state is critical to absorb those nutrients in the first place. So addressing the microbiome needs to be the first phase of how you deal with um, the acute infection or chronic infection. Uh, the success of preventive measures like vaccines also is going to depend on one's immune capabilities. Simple measures can, can make a big difference. So try to diversify the diet. Try to reduce your stress. Get outside. Get your bare feet in the grass. Get outside. Breathe fresh air. Um, use a spore-based researched probiotic. Uh, focus on leaky gut solutions. Bring down inflammation any way you can. Prebiotics also have a major impact on the immune system, and those should be considered as a second step in um, kind of in for reinforcing the changes that have been done with the probiotic, we can move to phase two and reinforce that and really increase the growth of those commensals so that the changes stay long-term. Polyphenols and omega-3 fatty acids can also be powerful support tools. And I wanna thank you for your time today and I will be happy to answer any questions I'm happy to talk about COVID long haulers in the Q&A too and uh, answer any questions that you guys have. I'll look forward to that. Um, thank you for your time. And a big thank you to Dr. Do Tom Bain. And guys, let's add, let's add the COVID long hauler to our Q&A <laughs> since you brought it up. It wasn't asked yet, but I'm actually very curious now that you mentioned that. So just want to remind you guys, if you want to watch this lecture again, if you want the handouts to this lecture, the slide presentation, and if you want to watch the microbiome and infertility lecture and have a handouts to that lecture, go to the microbiome page on the IFS and go to sponsors and find the microbiome page, or just contact them directly and say, you want the two IFS lecture handouts, please, and let us know about your specials. So whatever way, reach out to them. They're happy to work with you guys and talk to you. So this is the microbiome page on the IFS website. Um, you can get to it from going to the healthyseminars.com website on the top menu, click IFS 2021, and then that will take you to the IFS website, click on sponsors, and then find the microbiome labs. And as I mentioned, if you scroll down, they talk about their programs, they talk about their specials, and they have another one exclusive for new customers. And then if you click here, it will take you to a landing page. And on this landing page, this is where you can um, you'll send them information and they will then follow up with you and send you your handouts if you want and more information about the product.
Here's the lecture you just watched. So if you want to watch this again, because there is, is dense, lots of good inf information, you can go to their sponsor page and watch it again. And they also have a lecture on the microbiome and infertility, and that's also on their sponsor page. So just want to let you know that's there. And then for those that are part of the IFS, that sponsor page is open to all of you. And if you're part of the IFS, you've registered, do go to the special offers because all of our exhibitors, our sponsors, including Microbiome Labs, have shared that. All right, now we're going to do some Q&A with the live um, uh, Tom Bain. So again, Tom, thanks for putting together that, that lecture. Much appreciated. Kind of weird um, to yourself talk there, but uh, I'll it is weird, eh? It's always <laughs> weird to see yourself talk. Um, so can you comment on babies that are born by cesarean section? Are they more prone to the rotavirus? So what's interesting is what, what we're seeing is that the, when we, you know, when we, when I was, I'm, I'm 25 years out, out of, out of chiropractic school. When I was in chiropractic school, we were taught that the, uh, the uterus is this pristine, uh, infection free area that there's no bacteria. There are, there's nothing there. Nothing could be further from the truth. So there's actually data that shows that macrophages will actually go into mom's microbiome and start seeding into the amniotic fluid so that baby, as, she, as baby swallowing the amniotic fluid, will start to get um, some early inoculation into the microbiome during in utero. And then through the birth canal, it gets a big inoculum of the bacteria, right? So if we take a C-section baby, what we see, oh, and, and the, the inoculum from, that's coming from the amniotic fluid from the macrophages, that's mostly proteobacteria. So that's, you know, we want proteobacteria in the, in the microbiome, but we don't want a, a proteobacteria dominant microbiome, right? So, so it's interesting why the macrophages choose those particular bacteria, but that's the early, um, you know, early seeding of the, of the microbiome that way. And then the, the big inoculum comes through the, the birth canal and then breastfeeding. There's 600 different bacteria that we know of in, in breast milk that are seeding the, the microbiome. So a C-section baby, when we look at their microbiomes, their microbiomes actually look more like the bacteria on the hands of the doctors and the nurses. Um, and so what that does, that, that means that their microbiome is redundant, it lacks diversity, and it lacks keystone strains. And so that makes it susceptible to everything. Uh, for me to comment specifically on rotavirus wouldn't be fair because it, I can't say that it's more susceptible to rotavirus than it is any other virus or any other fungus or any other yeast or anything like that. You're the, these are opportunistic organisms that can take advantage of the fact that the microbiome is redundant and, and lacks diversity. And it can cripple the immune system quickly in that child because of that lack of diversity. So, so the, the short answer to the question is yes, but the long answer is it's not really fair to single out rotavirus. It's really whatever that baby comes in contact, they're going to be more susceptible to COVID and long haulers. So this is very new. So what are you, what do you know clinically? What's research? What's the theory? COVID and long haulers. And maybe introduce, somebody may not have heard the term long hauler. I, I'm assuming everybody on this webinar has heard of COVID, but they might not have heard of long haulers. So, and you know what? There's lots of different ways of saying it. And we may be saying it down here in the South, different than you guys say it up there in the North, but uh, the long haulers are the ones that just, you know, they, they don't have their sense of taste and smell back after six months, or they've got continued fatigue uh, three, four, five months beyond the actual contraction of the virus. Uh, they're exhibiting si signs and symptoms uh, long past uh, the in initial exposure to the virus. So we're calling those people long haulers. And we've got a very close relationship with one of the lead researchers at the uh, VA hospital in West Palm Beach, Florida. And we've been doing a lot of research with him and trying to understand that he specifically has been looking at um, long haulers and asymptomatic uh, spreaders. Um, so he, that's been his focus since this started. And, you know, this is a very smart man, a lot smarter than me. I don't have too many original ideas. I'm more like a, I, I take information in and then I process it and 
regurgitated. I'm not an original thinker. So these thoughts aren't mine. Uh, but in his mind, the long hauler is plain and simple. It's, it's one thing. It is an autoimmune response to the virus that they got. And so in order to um, manage it, you have to manage the autoimmune outbreak that's going on in the body. Now, what that means is Mr. Jones, he could have been predisposed to rheumatoid and he gets COVID and now his joints hurt. Now his joints are swelling. He's free rheumatoid. He's starting to show signs that he's moving into rheumatoid arthritis. Mrs. Jones might have been tipping towards Hashimoto's and now she's showing more signs and symptoms of that. So we actually see known autoimmune diseases where the patient wasn't exhibiting those signs and symptoms and now they are post COVID. That's an example of a long hauler. And then the other is that they're not showing any signs and symptoms of a known autoimmune disease, but they're continuing on with their, um, their ongoing fatigue, uh, their, uh, their ongoing lack of smell, taste, uh, their brain fog, uh, the, the basic symptoms that people are, are, are expressing with COVID, they're continuing to express them. But when we look at all these patients, the common thread are, is the continued cytokine storm. We started the match, the fire started, and we can't put it out. It, no matter what we do, the fire won't go out. In fact, it seems to be spreading. So that's what a long hauler is. And a long hauler needs to be treated as an autoimmune patient needs to be treated. In my opinion, an autoimmune patient, you need to you need to snap their immune system. You need to kind of whip it back into shape. And the best way to do that is to modulate their microbiome, increase their keystone species so that they're making lots of short chain fatty acids. You're reducing the inflammation in their gut first. And then that translates into a systemic reduction in inflammation over time. Uh, that's how we, when we do autoimmune lectures, when we do those types of talks, that's what, that's what our protocols show. This is no different. Um, what we're looking at is we need modulation of the microbiome. You need to start in the microbiome with an autoimmune disease patient. You need to start in the microbiome with a, with a COVID long haul. And so with that, we like to use our, our total gut restoration program. That's the, the Megaspore for by itself for a month, then Megaspore and Mega Prebiotic and Mega Mucosa for another three months. And so that's, that's the total gut restoration program. And, uh, and that's what we're recommending. And that's what... That's what we're seeing with the, the long haulers. We're seeing great results. We're seeing people sent to smell and taste come back after being gone for five, six months uh, after implementing these protocols. And, and let's be honest, people, like these are the people that we're going to be seeing in our practices, right? You know, these are the people that are going to be frustrated. They can't find any help. They're not getting any better. And they're going to they're going to end up in our offices. So to have these tools at your disposal and to be able to market yourself as somebody that can help these long haulers we think is a, is a, is a great opportunity. We are doing research with the doctor in, uh, in Florida so that we can present the data. But what I'm sharing with you now is our experiences and our uh, findings that we're seeing in both the research and in the clinical setting so that you can utilize them now while we wait for the research to get done. Nothing takes longer in life than research and COVID has doubled down on that. Um, getting research started, getting it, getting everything done with research. It's been horrible with COVID and it's still in a bad place. So rather than having to wait for the research, trying to share this information with you now, uh, so you can utilize that with your patients as, as they start to show up. Thank you. Now we have a few more minutes together. So I want to go through as many of these questions as possible. I have a few people that have PM, PM me, private message me here in our chat, asking me about can I have the handouts? The answer is yes. Contact Microbiome Labs. Don't contact us. Contact them. They're happy to share it. I've been asked about where you can ship it and the, and the fee structure, and I've been asked about their special. Again, just contact the Microbiome Lab from the link we've told you or go to their website. Let them know you're part of the IFS lecture and just ask for the handouts and ask for pricing details. They are happy to do that on an individual basis and based on where you live, let you know what that looks like. Back to our Q&A. Any research you're familiar with related to the endometriosis in the microbiome? Because a lot of endometriosis, recent research is talking about, um, uh, uh, what is it, BCL6, B-cell lymphoma 6, um, intralumpin 6, T and alpha, all these inflammatory markers. 
and your talk about COVID and just immune seems a lot of stuff around inflammation. Are you aware of any research with the microbiome and endometriosis? And do you have any data about treating the microbiome, especially using your product with women with um, endometriosis? So what's interesting is those same cytokines are part of the uh, leaky gut process. Just the, the, the spilling of LPS in the bloodstream, we see that that's the low grade inflammation that we see on a daily basis, right? So, so um, the question here, and, and when you look at this from a critical research standpoint, right? Like I can put on my research hat and I can put on my clinician's hat. The clinician's hat is much more willing to uh, build bridges between two thoughts. Whereas the research side says, we can't build bridges. We have to, we have to clearly create a situation where we can definitively say whether something's true or not, right? So when we look at the clinical side, I would have to say no. I would have to say that the best we can say right now is that the two situations could feed each other. Um, if you had an existing uh, leaky gut or a problem with leaky gut and, and it, it could irritate a, an existing endometriosis situation because it's the same type of inflammatory cascade that's going on, that's safe. We can definitely say that. But to say that I have research that shows that the microbiome being out of balance drives the endometriosis, that's not fair. I, I can't really say that. Um, but if I have an endometriosis patient sitting in front of me and I can say, listen, there's a, the pathophysiology of your disease is that there's a lot of inflammation. That same kind of inflammation exists in other parts of your body. My feeling is if we can reduce that, that that will help the inflammation that's with your endometriosis. Hey. Makes sense. Fair. Okay. We're getting close on time. So I'm going to try and rapid fire these for you, Tom. Um, what do you recommend after initial program? Um, so what are you doing for um, the maintenance? So they've gone through that initial program. What are you doing for maintenance? And then they also said, um, can you also talk about the complementary powders, the powders that go with your yeah, that's, what, that's what I just talked about. That was in the, um, what we're talking about, the total gut restoration. That's the prebiotic and the mucosal repair support. So that's, that's those two supportive powders. Um, but oh, shoot, now I forgot what the first part of your question was. So they, um, what do they do for the maintenance program? So they've oh, gone yeah. through that so, first three months. Well, here's the thing, right? The problem is every time we eat, we disrupt our microbiome, right? So until we figure out how to live in this world without eating, we need constant support of our microbiome. So when you're talking about maintenance, what I do is I, I still use the same products. I just rather use them on a daily basis. I use them on a weekly basis. And so I keep the doses the same, but like with Megaspore, I may, I'll tell my patients to take it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? Even, even, unhe even, healthy people, uh, even unhealthy people tend to eat better during the week than they do on the weekends, right? So if I say, take your Megaspore full dose, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, take the week off, uh, do that. Add a scoop of the prebiotic and mucosal support one time on the weekends and just do it because you need it because you're eating all the time. So you're stressing your body out. Um, so have that support on a weekly basis. You don't need it on a daily basis. So that's how we shift to, uh, to, to a maintenance type, type dose. What about the microbiome and si si sinus health? Um, I love any information you have about research, et cetera. Do you have it? So I'll contact you. Um, also studies that connect anxiety to the microbiome. So sinus health in the microbiome, anxiety in the microbiome. Is there data available for this now? Um, and if so, um, they want to know, so they'll contact you for it. So you can go on our website for the anxiety information. That's established and it, it's available. That, that's not a problem. The sinus stuff has been something we've been working through. Again, it's a theory that we had. Right. If you can, if you can fix the mucosal area, if you can fix the mucin two layer in the gut, then that has a beneficial impact on all the mucus in the body, all the mucus layers in the body. Right. So, so what we, in theory, what we did was we started thinking, well, if we can fix the gut microbiome, that should have a benefit in the sinus. Um, and, and we've seen some benefits with that, but it's kind of like saying. You know, I could take this little speedboat across the ocean. I could do that, uh, but I'd rather fly across the ocean. So, um, so point is, we've been experimenting using spores in, intranasally, 
Um, I've been using, for chronic sinus infections, I've been using a combination of HU58 with just some saline and mixing that and, and doing a nasal rinse with that and having fantastic results, such good results that we've started a, uh, a research study in the Northwest of the US uh, with, a, with a clinic there that they focus on sinus infections. And so, so I would recommend taking a capsule, mixing it into an ounce of water and adding that with a dropper into the sinuses, let it run through maybe uh, two or three times a day. Very good for chronic sinus infections. But at the same time, you got to fix the gut. But that's that's the long term plan to prevent future outbreaks. You got the acute infection. I would use the nasal rinse. Um, somebody said they think their six month old puppy could use this. Um, any yeah. thoughts? Can pets take this? So actually, we have a they can 100 percent. It's just an expensive product for for dogs. And so we have a, a dog version. It's called Phytospore. It's available on the uh, on the on the website. Uh, we actually did a study in Romania where we showed that dogs have leaky guts, and and the way that we created leaky gut in dogs is we took their kibble and we slapped a big slap of uh, coconut oil on it, and that took them from a healthy gut to a leaky gut. It was just that extra coconut oil. Uh, so don't be feeding your dogs extra coconut oil. Uh, but so that gave them the leaky gut. Then we gave them this combination of spores, and that corrected their leaky gut. So your puppy needs phytospore. Uh, if you've got my megaspore at home, you've got it and you want to use it, you can. There's no problem using it. Phytospore is about half the price. Thank you. Um, after antibiotic treatments, what is the best avenue to repopulate the microbiome? So a great question, but I'm going to, and I, I mean nothing but respect by the question, poorly asked in my, would be my first response because I don't believe repopulation is the right word, okay? What we do is we recondition, okay? You have a fingerprint of bacteria that make up your microbiome. It's unique to you. No one else in the universe has the same makeup of bacteria that you have in your microbiome. And no matter how many antibiotics you take, no matter how much bad things you do, that signature never goes away. It may be overrun by numbers, by other bacteria, yeast, and things like that. But the signature is always there and that uniqueness is always there. So the way that you overcome the mess that's there, however it got there, is you send in spores to police the environment, to get rid of the bad guys and create an environment for that signature that you got from your mom for those bacteria to increase in their numbers. That's how you do it. So it's not really repopulation. What we're looking at doing is we're trying to restore the short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. Those are strict anaerobes. You've never seen a probiotic that has acromensium mucinophilia in it. It doesn't exist. We cannot isolate these bacteria and put them in pill form. It doesn't work that way. Yet we need them in order to get a healthy microbiome. What we've been able to find is that by killing off the pathogens and, and, and creating it, you know, the spores themselves make short chain fatty acids. So they're changing that environment and that allows your signature bacteria to increase in their numbers. And that's how you overcome however you stressed your microbiome, antibiotics, whatever it might be. This has been excellent. Again, I want to thank um, Dr. Tom Bain. We've reached our time here. Um, if you're interested in the microbiome product and other complementary products that they offer, um, do contact Microbiome Labs. Um, they also will provide you research papers and other information, and they can provide you the handout slide deck for this lecture. Also, the microbiome and infertility lecture that's on the IF Symposium website. And anybody, anybody can, um, can watch that um, lecture as well. It's available uh, right now. And um, again, a big thank you to the microbiome people. They've also put a special together. So just if you're interested in the product, contact them. And um, we're hoping, you know, just to let you know if you guys are interested, we may even get Tom to come back and do the fertility one for a live Q and A. We're thinking of we're thinking of opening up the IFS registration again um, and extending it. So we haven't decided yet, and so we'll keep posted if you're interested. Let us know if you're interested. If there's big interest, then we may open up registration and extend the IFS and have more pop up lectures and sponsor talks for you guys as you work through the CU courses. 
Um, again, Tom, thank you very much. Thanks for putting this lecture together. Thanks for the specials and thanks for uh, um, having research around your product too. That's always um, appreciative. So we're glad to have you back supporting the IFS and uh, contributing to the IFS by sharing great um, lecture content. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Always happy to be here. Now let's just unmute ourselves. This is the time where we thank our speaker for sharing the information. We give them back some cheese, some TLC. So feel free to open up your mics and give Tom a big uh, thank you. Hello, how are you? All right, good job. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Oh. All right. I see Wally's here too, eh, Wally? <laughs> All right, everybody. That was great, Tom. Again, thanks. We'll chat about your fertility one. I think it'd be a good Q&A one. There's more questions about thin lining and inflammation in the uterus. So um, I think we could have some really good discussions on this. You guys can also go to the forms on the IFS if you're registered. And if we open it up, you can come to the forms as well. Um, because you, we can continue the microbiome talk and the gut health talk, and inflammation talk. So that's where the forum is, where there's 400 plus people there discussing topics. After we hear a lecture, we continue to discuss and learn. So feel free to post there. If I see anything that I want Tom to respond to, I, I will let him know. Check out the forums under special offers because all of our sponsors, including microbiome, have offered you special deals. And again, I'll remind you that the recording to this lecture and the fertility lecture are on their sponsor page, available to anybody as part of the IFS, and do contact Microbiome Labs directly if you would like a copy of these handouts and the ones for the fertility talk. All right, everybody, take care, and Tom, thank you as well.